You're listening to the Hawk Media Podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping entrepreneurs and executives crush the digital marketing game. Whether you're looking for techniques and strategies or tools and resources, you've come to the right place. Let's get into the show. All right. You're listening to Hawk Talk. We're live here with Xavier Kochart. How you doing, man? I'm well. I'm well. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. You are you are a legend, man. So it's pretty cool to be on your show. No, this is super fun. It's a long time coming. So uh, got to start it out as we always do. You know, I want to I want to make an assumption at three years old. Did you have like the power suit on doing giant M&A deals for major media technology companies? Like, is that how it started? Is that where you just <laughs> immediately hit the ground running out of the womb and started doing big deals or take me back? Like, where are you from? Let's hear about the childhood side. Yeah. Um, no, not, I, I did not know. I mean, it's, it's funny and probably one of the, the, the themes that uh, at least I have discovered in my own life is um, how, how serendipitous the path has been and how um, every, time, every time I definitely thought I had a plan in life, um, something kind of hit me, uh, in many cases not, not at my own volition, uh, and it sort of redirected me. And so, but looking back, it's, it's kind of been good. Um, so no, my origin, I did not know I was going to be doing this at all. Um, Where I, was, uh, I was from New York. I'm from New York originally. And, uh, you know, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm a Yankees fan. I, I grew up um, uh, just outside the city. And uh, I, I was just a, a kid that honestly just, uh, I, I have, I've actually, believe it or not, I've become over the years, I was a very social kid. Uh, love to, t- to chat with everybody, love to interact with everybody, love to engage with everybody. And I feel like as the years have gone on, I've gotten less social. I've gotten uh, less interactive. Um, and I don't know if that's a function of, of age or, or cynicism, or maybe I'm just tired. I, I think it, it, it's, it's all of the above, which happens to me too. But I also think like this whole quarantine thing highlighted that like as extroverted as I thought I was, I, I'm, I'm good. Like, as you just said, I'm sitting in a mountain cabin with my wife by ourselves in the middle of nowhere. Like, I like this. I like talking to you. I like getting on Clubhouse, all these things. Um, but I, I don't necessarily need to be around 100 people all the time. So it's interesting. Um, so, okay. So but just outside of, you grew up outside of New York. Whereabouts were just outside of New York or outside of New York? Originally from Rigo Park, Queens, and then Fort Lee, New Jersey. Cool. And tell me about upbringing, parents. Like, what were your parents entrepreneurs? Was your dad in media and technology? Like, where, where did they... How did they help steer your childhood? Um, you know, uh, I, I I grew up as a, uh, as a, as a first generation uh, um, child of uh, of immigrant uh, uh, parents, and uh, you know we did not come. My parents did not come here, uh, you know, as as uh, doctors or lawyers or anything like that. So um, growing up, I had a I watched them um, I watched them struggle. I watched them uh, just kind of hustle, work hard. And, um, uh, and so it was really, I, I think as a young child, I, um, I actually didn't, you know, it's, it's so interesting. Uh, there's, there's two interesting things um, that kind of, first of all, I recommend that if you can, everybody in the world should, should live one, one year of their life in New York City or a place as as uh, richly diverse as New York City. And I don't just mean ethnically diverse, but I mean just diversity of thought. Uh, and, and that's also kind of a, another recurring theme uh, across my life, diversity of thought. Um, and part of, the, part of the reason for that is, uh, you know, for a very, very long time, uh, I actually did not even realize, you know, diversity and inclusion is, has right, rightfully taken uh, its, its kind of place both in the workforce and in, in our culture, in our zeitgeist, in our society. Um, but for a very, very long time, I didn't even realize that um, I was a person of color because um, in New York City, there were, I didn't even know who, who the majority and the minorities were. So, because um, it was all, it was all diverse like that. And, and similarly, I didn't really know, I didn't really know that we were poor. Um, and so uh, I just thought a lot of the, the habits that, that I formed as a child um, we're, uh, we're not based in, you know, like I, I believe that life or our, our perception of life is relative and it's, it's, it's not absolute, even though life, even though metrics are absolute, but our appreciation for those are, are relative. So I didn't really have a relative basis for that. So, you know, I had, um, 
I had two very hardworking parents, very loving parents. Um, and my mother uh, worked in a, in a hospital um, and she, she came over here working in a hospital and uh, as a registered dietitian um, for many years. In fact, she just recently retired. So I actually saw um, in my childhood, I saw the transition between, um, you know, how my immediate family, um, I guess, climbed out of one class, socio socioeconomic class to another. Um, mm -hmm. And it was purely based off of um, chutzpah. I mean, it was my dad's chutzpah. That's awesome. And so you, you've got a really unique sort of career in the fact that you are both an entrepreneur and sort of a corporate bigwig, which is not common. It, it really isn't to have both the senior executive title at a corporation and be you know, truly a builder from scratch. Um, I'm curious, like, kind of what came first? Like, so it, when you were a kid, were you also on entrepreneurial endeavors? Were you building little businesses as a preteen or what was going on through your childhood? What was your focus? Um, so I, I would say, uh, I, I'd say that the honest answer to that um, is yeah. no, I was not a... Um, the honest answer. Yeah. <laughs> and why, why'd you do it? Well, so um, my true passion... Uh, so, and actually this does tie into the origin story if, if, you're, if you're interested, which is um, um, back in the day, um, my, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the hustles that my dad had, um, uh, he and a friend of his owned a, uh, a video store, um, like, like an old school video store. I don't know how many people um, that are listening to Hawk Talk now um, or on the Clubhouse audience even remember these, but before there was even, uh, certainly before streaming, certainly before DVDs, um, and before Blockbuster, the um, the distribution of like, movies um, to your house was done through a a uh, very very fragmented, uh, a large and fragmented sort of mom and pop retail video store yep. network. And um, uh, it was almost like you could like anybody could open one. And so my father and his uh, and his very good friend, who's uh, that, that's they've become very close family friends of ours for uh, in, in our family, um, they had a video store. And when my dad, my dad, because my mom worked in a hospital um, all day. And so my dad, when he picked me up from school, when I was just a kid, um, he would bring me back to the video store because he had to work in the video store. And I sat in the back and I watched every single Disney movie. I mean, this is like I'm probably age five, six, you know, yeah. something like that. I watched every single Disney movie, every single Warner Brothers, Looney Tunes cartoon. Um, and then after I was done with that, I started moving uh, along the, you know, all the different uh, all the other movies, all the other genres. I think uh, higher education in our country has been, uh, the, the cost of it has gone up and up and up. Not that it's not valuable, but at a certain price, anything can be valuable or anything can be not valuable. So yeah. that's, that's more there. Yeah. Answer to that. No, that makes sense. So you get out of school. What's next? Would you go, did you know you went right into media? You knew you wanted to do content? What happened from there? Um, you know, <laughs> it's the same thing. Like you get recruited and, um, and everybody was going, um, investment banking or, or strategy consulting. So I thought, okay, maybe that's what you're supposed to do. And yeah. so, um, I did that. Um, uh, I went, I worked for an investment bank in California. Uh, and, uh, I was in corporate finance. I was, um, Which one? uh, Tucker Anthony Sutro. Um, it's now it, it's since been acquired by the Royal Bank of Canada. Um, yeah. and, um, uh, and I did uh, uh, mid-market uh, uh, IPOs, private placements, M and A's, that kind of thing. But as an analyst uh, yeah. uh, or associate, rather, and and it was a um, it was very it was a very very interesting time. Um, and it's so I, like I can't even it's it's hard as today I manage folks and I've managed folks and and I am managed of course by others. Um, it's hard to even imagine that that era existed, but that was the era of 100 to 120 hour work weeks in the office. And after you did that, you um, you used to just say thank you. Um, yeah. And uh, so that so so anyway, so I did that to start. I did. So There's a great UBS commercial they launched like a week ago. It's like the most contrived. It, it got all the like big meme accounts for finance posted it that you've got to watch it but it's a ubs like a, a day in the life of an investment banker supposedly now they meditate during lunch and they take yoga in the morning all together and it's, it's this thing that's like this is not investment banking nor is it what draws people to it but it was pretty funny well you know it's funny there was one year that i was a banker and this is no exaggeration i came into the office 
every single calendar day of the year. Um, well, actually, with the exception of Christmas. Uh, but no, 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 that's not true. Christmas. <laughs> no, no, I think I did come in for Christmas, but I just to fax something, but only for like an hour or something. So, and at that point, you're almost at the end of the year. You got to prove a point. Yeah, at that point, you know. But it's funny because um, I'm. I know that I. You know, I, I have I have so much respect for our men and women of uh, that serve this country in the armed forces. But I can only imagine um, I can only imagine when you do something that challenging, that hard, that where you have to sacrifice your um, your entire being for, you know, in, in their case, for our country. But in our case or in my case for this for this company, it's I think it's great to have done that early in my life. Yeah. Because after that, um, I was never afraid of hard work. I was never, never afraid of uh, all-nighters. I was never afraid of um, uh, you know problems that I didn't know how to solve. Now, yeah. to be clear, I was I was super afraid when it was going on, and I didn't half the time, if not most of the time, didn't know what the heck I was doing, and um, just kind of flew by the seat of my pants. But, but that's, um, that's but that's a comfort level that I think serves people. If you're comfortable being uncomfortable, you'll continue to push, continue to try things. I think that's actually a good thing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, and and look, and the other thing that's happened there is that when you are in the trenches, and I think this is the case for for not just banking, but for for anything, like for um, entrepreneurs that have a, a founding team, or um, for anything like a sports team or something. But any, when you give your your life to something um, for anything. But when you're in the trenches with somebody, um, you end up, you end up like there's no better way to bond with somebody than to go through common crisis or common, you it's, know. It, it, in a bad way, it is the whole thesis behind hazing in the fraternity world. <laughs> yeah, they yeah. crap together and they all bond more. It, it's the, I mean, it is it's human nature. It is what happens. Right, and so so some of those some of those um, people that um, that I worked with alongside uh, in banking are some of my closest friends today. And they've all gone on to do amazing things. And our bond stays because, you know, there's, because that time is never coming back again, where um, in addition to in addition to working 100 and 120 hour a week. And by the way, just to just to kind of kind of do the math on that, I, I would come in the office at 8 a.m. and not and on a weekday, um, go home at like 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that also means a good eight, 10 hours on the weekends too. And when you're, when you're doing that with somebody else, that's, that's not going to happen again, particularly with, with, um, all the efficiencies of technology and work from home. I mean, now we don't even have to go to the office. Many people don't have to, many people do. So, yep. uh, so yeah. No, it makes sense. So how long were you in banking for? About two years, two and a half years, actually. And then, two and a half years. Yeah. What happened yeah. next? Well, um, it's, it's funny. I, <laughs> I, I got really, really lucky. And, um, and I, you know, again, looking back on my life, I think there are these, there are these, what I'll call hinge points in my life where, um, where things happened around me and to me, but not because of me. However, what I had done in my life to prepare myself but by the way, I didn't even know I wasn't to prepare myself necessarily for these things, but how I had prepared myself or how others had prepared me, I should a better way to put it. Um, that enabled me to kind of, in some cases, fall into the next opportunity and in other cases, leap into the next opportunity. And this was one of those cases. So I, um, I had gotten, um, you know, because, you know, I sort of busted my butt and worked hard and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'd gotten close to one of the, um, the partners at the investment bank, and he had a um, uh, and he took me on business development calls, which was kind of a it wasn't a it wasn't a common thing. It wasn't a common thing at, uh, for somebody at my level to be taken on a business development calls because when you're when you're a low level guy, you're just you're a grunt and you just do the analysis. Um, but I you know he took me on one of these. And uh, this was in some, uh, this was, I had already moved down to LA at this point. And uh, our, um, our office was in West LA. And the business development call was a company in um, Pasadena. Well, the meeting, we got there, um, the meeting uh, went long, it went really long. And, and as, and when we got back in the car, he drove and we got back in the car, he, uh, he turned to me and said, Xavier, I, I don't have time to drop you back in the office. 
um, and I have a lunch. So you're just going to have to come with me to the lunch. And I, and I said, sure, no problem. But he looked at me and he said, don't say anything stupid, you know? And I had no idea. I, I was like, okay. And I'm just like kind of a, a I'm like, good. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, it turns out the lunch was at Barney Greengrass uh, in Beverly Hills. And the lunch was with a very senior agent at the William Morris agency. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, sure enough, I sat there. Um, and I mean, I didn't, I wasn't a mute. I, you know, you know, I said hello and those types of things, but I listened and I listened to this conversation, um, that was happening between this power agent and, and I guess a power investment banker. Right. And I, it was amazing. I have a lot of, I have a lot of respect and time for Paul and, and quite frankly, all of my mentors at William Morris, um, that really, they have no idea how much they have they affected me uh, in a positive way and how much I learned from them. So, so you, um, did you like right there? You quit and went to William Morris? No, no. So I didn't quit. I um, so like you know, I guess I guess what if they if, if they write the book on my life, they'll say I quit and I just but actually in, yeah. in the real world, it doesn't quite work that way. You know, it's like you know, my partner. I mean, my uh, the investment banker um, uh, senior partner. He, was, he kind of, he was, he's this great guy too. And, and he said, whoa, really? You want to do that? Oh, wow. And I said, yeah. Because remember, remember, I had this love for the, the entertainment industry, like growing up. And, um, and actually what ended up happening was, you know, okay, I'll put in a call, this, that. And it didn't happen immediately. Like there's, you know, when something opened up and this, and I just got lucky because something, something opened up. Um, yeah, it wasn't immediately. It was probably six, six, seven, eight months later. Um, and I had an opportunity then to be one of the first, uh, I think it was the fifth agent in Hollywood that represented, uh, at the time that represented, uh, companies, um, which is now, by the way, that's a big thing in Hollywood to, uh, represent the company. Hey, by the way, you do, you, in large part, you do something like that now too, in, uh, with Hawk. We Media. also work with those departments at WME and CAA and everything like that. And funny enough, we're an investor in Paul Brico's in incubator that he spun out of WME to start Amplify. So know him well. Like yeah, yeah, and so, but it's funny. It's the other thing, you know. As we uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm trying to be. Con I, I, I don't mind. I don't mind sharing names, but I'm trying to be conscious to not share names, just to not make it too, um, uh, you know, inside, uh, inside baseball or anything. That's what people want. You mean <laughs> one of the things that I think Eric, you, you know, from being in, in the business for as long as you have, and yeah. also um, just from being uh, knowing a lot of companies, you know will find that if you stick with something, um, if you stick with an industry long enough um, or a practice area long enough, you end up getting to know every, everybody sort of knows everybody at some point, right? I liken it to um, almost like high school. Like when you go exactly. into high school, like, yep. in your freshman year, the high school seems so big. And um, depending on if you went to a big or small high school, but, but even as a freshman, even as a small high school, it seems so big. And the teachers and the students and the upperclassmen and all that kind of stuff. And then think back to then your senior year, the high school seems so small and everybody kind of knows everybody, you know, the teachers, you know, and you know, they'll, they'll look at you and they'll say, Eric, don't pull that again. And it's almost like there's a shorthand or, you know, that kind like of a very similar experience in high school. <laughs> what happened with you? I'm just saying that don't pull that again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and so, you know, like I think, I think what that speaks to and what I've tried to do, by the way, didn't always get this right. And particularly when I was a, a, a younger man, I didn't get this, get this right because I was, I was after, I was after the, um, I was after the results. And I think the most important thing is um, because the world is, is small and because if you really want to go deep in anything, um, eventually, eventually that world will get smaller and everybody will know everybody. So it's very, very important to keep a good reputation. And yeah. by the way, the way you keep a good reputation is not just to be successful. In fact, I would actually put that kind of further down on the list of things. But the way you keep a good reputation is, um, I guess the, the broader way of saying this is um, to be kind and generous. And maybe the more the business way of saying this is, is uh, try to think what you can do for other people um, and how you can make their lives better and if you if, honestly, if you do that, even if not a lick comes back to you, um, it will. It, it will. will. Yeah, that's the thing. It might not be direct, but it always does. Um, and I you know, I, I, I have to say, Eric, and um, 
not just because you've had me, you have me on your show, but I have to say at a, at, you're obviously a very, very successful entrepreneur and um, you know, you're, you're, you know, not the oldest guy in the world, but I think you have figured this out. And, and I think part of the reason your business has grown exponentially, your network has grown exponentially. And I have, I have been the beneficiary of this from you, Eric, is your generosity. And I've seen you be generous to other people. And I think one of the easiest ways to be generous, one of the easiest ways to be generous is generous in your relationship. And that's one thing I, I strive to do. Um, and which is why I say to you, Eric, you know, my database is your database. And I have seen that absolutely in practice with you, um, to me and to others. And I think that you just grow exponentially, you know, or even I, beyond I, algorithmically in that fashion. I totally agree. It's been big and I appreciate it. Um, all right. So William Morris, got to keep the path going. What, yeah. How long were you there? Uh, I was there about three years, three and a half years. Um, and um, I, uh, oh. it's, it's funny, I, I, I left, I saw an opportunity um, mm-hmm. in, so I, in addition to the great, um, the great agents in, uh, we called it corporate packaging, corporate advisory, new media at the time, um, I had, um, I had some other really great senior, senior agents that I had learned from that were in other parts of the business, uh, television, um, mostly television and in particular television syndication. And there is one agent that was really, uh, was always kind to me and, you know, kindness, it's so interesting. Um, sorry, sorry. I'm going to like spend a second on this because it relates to my life, but, um, but you know, you know, life goes, if you believe life goes up and life goes down, right. Which I do. I think that sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. That's just the way it goes. In fact, you know, um, I used to play poker for a long time and I, I have this theory that, you know, everybody gets, there's a standard distribution and everybody gets the same amount of, of good hands and bad hands given enough time. Some people get all their hands right. hand up front or not there, or that you get a, a chunk of bad hands all at once, but everybody gets, like life goes up, life goes down. Yeah. And, you know, I feel like when you are up, okay, well, we know when you're down, right? It's, 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 I don't want to say it's easier to be generous, but like you're kind of like going, hey, I'll help you out and maybe you can help me out too or something like that. Yeah. But I think it's, it's when you are up, it's a very, not only, not only do you have a responsibility, but I actually think it is, it's really important to, because um, it's important to almost selfishly to give to others because you are in a spot to give to others. Life goes up, life goes down. And when you're down, it's actually harder to give. So yep. when you are up, you should be in a spot to give. And I got to tell you, man, like I, I wish I had learned this lesson a little earlier. And, um, and so anyway, so the reason I bring this up is because there was a probably the highest revenue uh, producing agent at William Morris at the time was, had no reason to be kind to me, none, but he was kind to me. And he was generous and he brought me into his clients and his deals. Um, and I learned from him. And uh, so when, when I left William Morris, he helped me um, put together and package uh, a, um, I became a packaging producer. Um, and I had this concept, um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I, this is bittersweet, but um, I had this concept, I, I, had, I had done some research. Um, and so this is about uh, 17 years ago or so, maybe a little more. Um, and I'd done this research. Um, 2003, uh, four, somewhere in there. What's that? 2003 or four is what you said. Uh, 2002, 2002, okay. I'd say three, 2002, yeah, 2002, 2003, like around there. And um, I, I had, um, uh, I had, I, because again, I, I'm a media guy, content guy, sport, uh, and sports, right? And I had done some research and I had noticed that uh, over the course of my dealings, um, you know, at, 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 as an agent, um, that the, either the number one or number two sport um, in almost every single country, and the almost means the ones that aren't, it's number three, um, was a combat sport. Meaning like some sort of like boxing or Muay Thai or um, capoeira or something like that. You know, jiu-jitsu, kung fu, you name it. Yeah. Um, Taekwondo. And so I had this crazy idea that um, I would go through, I would go all over the world and I would these um, these sports associations or these leagues, I would license um, I would license the rights to 
um, to uh, using their brands and their, um, their, their fighters, even in some cases, license the rights to produce a, uh, it, was, it, would, it would manifest itself in a television show, but produce a super league, if you will, yeah. of, um, of all different types of styles. An uh, ultimate league. What's that? Like an ultimate league. <laughs> like, like an ultimate league, yeah. right? But by the way, this was before then, right? Like I, I know the Fertitta brothers were working on something at the time. And, um, and this is also, also, I'll tell you, this is a great lesson. There's another great lesson in here about like, you know, how um, being successful is not just about um, having the, about being hardworking and having the right idea and being smart and all that kind of stuff, but it's also just timing and yeah. luck, right? And, I, and I'd actually say the, everything I said before timing and luck, those are table stakes. Yeah. But timing and luck, you're not going to actually totally break through unless you have the timing and luck, right? And um, so anyway, put this together. And the idea was, um, uh, <laughs> the idea was, uh, um, I was also a big fan. Like I said, remember, I watched every single movie, right? Like, uh, uh, so there's this um, old Jean-Claude Van Damme movie called Bloodsport. And um, it was set in Hong Kong. And it was basically a similar type of thing where different styles would compete. Think like Karate Kid. Um, but not just karate, right? Like different side, karate versus jiu-jitsu, jiu-jitsu versus boxing, like that kind of thing. And um, so I had this idea of um, putting together this league and I had done that. I'd, I'd acquired the rights, et cetera, and uh, um, took it to the networks. Um, and, and the networks, uh, I, you know, because of uh, the mentors that I had, I, I had an opportunity to like go directly to the networks. And every single network, um, <laughs> told me some version of the following. What is this thing you're, you're pitching us? It is um, this fighting thing. This, this, what are you called? This, these different martial, these different mixed martial arts, this will never work in this country. This only will work in, in third world countries. Americans will never put up with this type of violence and this, this type of fighting. Even though boxing was massive for a lot for 50 years. That's funny. And a couple of years later, of course, yeah, we know, you know, and so, um, and anyway, the um, I tell that story only because, looking back on it, had I had I um, had I had partnered with somebody like like a Mark Burnett, that thing we would have gotten that thing sold, right? Um, and what's in, really interesting is that I just wasn't ready in my career. And look, yes, it's a billion dollar idea that I was just either too early for or. Um, I, 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 in my own life, wasn't in a spot, but it's so interesting because years later, um, I started working with Mark Burnett and his partner at the time. Um, and, uh, I was just thinking, and I, I had become close to, to, uh, you know, his partner at the time as well. And I was just thinking, wow, if I had, if I had gotten to know him just two or three years earlier, how different things would be. Yeah. No, that's so. awesome. That's a great story. And it's, I think it's important. Like, you know, I, I see it all the time, even on Clubhouse, on all these things where, oh, I've had that idea. I already had that idea. It's like, well, idea is a good 1% of the whole, ex of what needs to happen. The idea is just the start and like the tiny, tiny decimal point of like what actually occurs to create a successful company and the right partners, the right timing, the right everything comes into play. Well, and you know, it's it's that thing about uh, about your reputation and your relationships, right? So. So we had put together well beyond just an idea. It was, we had the lead, we had everything. Oh, but we, didn't have, we didn't have the name, right? And there's certain people that have the name. And yeah. if you can get to those people, right? And, um, and if, they, if they believe in you, I actually, one of the lessons I learned early on is, you know, even though they may take sort of the lion's share of it, particularly when you're early in your life or early in your career, I would, I would, say, I would say this, um, I learned this, uh, um, I actually learned this from um, uh, from an ambassador that worked for uh, George Bush uh, Senior, the President George Bush uh, Senior. Um, he he told he told me and a group of my friends, um, and when he was telling his own story, he told us all, "Take less, so you can get more." And I honestly did not understand that at all. It made no sense to me. How can you take less? You know, but. Uh, but, you know, even early on, um, you know, give, you know, it's okay to give up a little bit more to make whatever your, whatever the idea, the company, yep. uh, the team, the organization, make that as successful as possible. 
um, because that will be your calling card down the line. Agreed. Um, so what happened after William Morris? What was next? What took you away from there? You know, I, um, one of the guys when I was uh, at, um, one of the guys that I, I was pitching to, um, was I, I also, it was sort of a catch all this group, you know, uh, we did digital, we did uh, um, technology, co- we represented, represented technology companies. And pretty much back then, this was the dot com 1.0 days, right? And um, anybody, any talent that wanted to go into the dot com business, right? They kind of threw to us too. And uh, one of the guys that I had pitched to, what had taken some clients to, actor clients, producer clients, et cetera, to, um, uh, uh, was a guy that was the general manager of go.com, which was a portal that Disney bought. Mm-hmm. And that guy's name was Kevin Mayer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I said I wasn't going to use names, but I'll use Kevin. Oh, you got to, yeah. If you're listening, thank you also. Um, and um, later, um, and, and then years later, he went to um, a strategy consulting firm and he built up, uh, he started a, um, the, uh, the global practice for media entertainment uh, and uh, and I worked for him in that strategy. Which, which consulting firm? Sorry, that, that's called Lek Consulting. Got Lek. Yeah. So you left WME to go to Lek Consulting to work for Kevin Mayer. Uh, yes, but 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 in between, I did that uh, the packaging stuff, and I actually oh, okay. we, yeah. we actually did a number of other. I'm just using that one piece of content, but we actually did we did uh, a lot of brand integration. Like it's funny, like a. Uh, uh, a lot of these videos and a lot of the like Instagram brand integration and all that, what, we, we were doing that years and years and years ago. And so this company that I had started at, at the time was doing uh, a, a lot of that as well. So, Got it. Um, but yeah, so they worked for Kevin uh, yeah. and worked for, um, uh, there was, it was Kevin, but there was another senior partner there. And again, up, like the running theme through my career is I have gotten so, first, I've gotten so damn lucky that I have, that I have been uh, working for some amazing, amazing executives. Um, and I would not even be halfway um, or even a quarter of the way of where I am today if I didn't have an opportunity to work for them. And I got to tell you something, a lot of this is dumb luck, right? Like, uh, who knows? They, I could have not worked for these people or I could have, I could have literally worked for the guy. Uh, think about this. There were multiple partners at that investment bank. What if the partner that had taken a liking to me didn't have was someone that didn't have the relationship with William Morris. Right. I mean, I may still be a banker at this point, you know? So, um, so a lot of it is luck. So, yeah. but anyway, so, so then Kevin, um, if anybody's, uh, knows the history of the Walt Disney company. Um, but when Bob, Bob Iger, uh, became the CEO, I think it was back in 2005. Um, uh, he brought in, um, Kevin Mayer as the new, um, uh, chief strategy officer. And, uh, and then because of Kevin, uh, Kevin then brought me over there a little later and I did, um, uh, I did the business development deals for, uh, and corporate business development deals and strategy, uh, for the Walt Disney company. I've heard of it. Um, uh, <laughs> how long, so how long were you at Disney? I was also there about two, two and a half years. And, um, and, and, uh, it was a, an amazing place. I, again, the, the purview and the learnings there, because, because I sat in corporate, I saw how the business, I w- I saw how all aspects of the business, all the divisions were running. And, yeah. um, and that was great learning. Absolutely great learning. Um, yeah, an incredible organization in terms of how to build a really solid one. Yeah. And, and, and frankly, I would say arguably the pinnacle of media. If you, you know, your dream was to work in media and entertainment, you, that is the pinnacle of Disney. I don't know that there's a, a more prominent company on the media side than that. Yeah. I mean, um, I have a lot of positive things to say about AT and T and Warner Media these days, but um, but yes, sure. I know fair, yeah, yeah. Of course, put you on the spot there, but um, yeah, in terms of the content that they have now own and created, it's some of the you know biggest stuff of all time. You know, and also, in particular, um, it's so funny how life works. Um, so uh, we'll get to it, but you know, I'm currently at AT and T and Warner Media, um, and what did I say that? Like, what were the pieces of content? that I initially got me down this path in the first place. It was the Disney yep. and Looney Tunes or Warner Brothers cartoons. Yeah. Right. And to find myself, you know, 30 years later, 40 years later, um, maybe, maybe not quite 40, but um, uh, the, uh, at both of these companies in, in, um, in, a, in a location, in a place, in a, in a role where I can even have even a small impact. Wow. Yeah. Like that's, wow. 
you know it's yeah. so cool so, so you you learn all about how disney operates what's next well oh, ah. <laughs> well i mean this is again back the my career is is less about companies and more about people right and i can i can track it to people and next um, I got to I got to know, and mostly because of his hustle, quite frankly, um, one of the best salesmen I have ever encountered in my life. Uh, one of the best hustlers, uh, and uh, in a guy called Michael Casson. Yep. And Michael Casson at the time um, was um, he was putting together. Uh, he was he was very small. Um, he was, uh, in, in fact. I seem to remember him being a one-man band at the time, and he had uh, some contractors and some assistants and all that. But he was uh, at the intersection. By the way, Michael Casson, for those who don't know, um, although I'm blown away if anybody doesn't know Michael Casson because he is the power broker of the um, advertising and media space. Um, he's the new super agent of the space. But um, uh, Michael at the time uh, had been the, um, the president of a media agency and then he um, left the media agency and he started, it, he just became sort of a consultant. And um, he asked me um, and we discussed and I came over and I helped him build that business. And that business, of course, today is known as MediaLink. And I, again, to, I mean, I came into his apartment every single day. That's, that's, the, that's how early it was. And I say this because there's no better learning than being right in somebody's house, you know? And by the way, when I say apartment, to be clear, it's not like a one bedroom apartment. He had an amazing, like in the Wilshire corridor. He's like, known as a great host too. He always had a nice place to host people. Absolutely. And Michael has always been great at hosting. And, uh, and so, and what he did and what it was, it was funny. He did what, what um, uh, my other mentors did um, along the way. And I think back to my mentor in the in investment bank, which is he brought me to everything. He yeah. brought me to every meeting. Now, listen, I'm not confused. He didn't bring me just because he was like, hey, kid, let me have you learn. I had to, I had to sit there. I had to take notes. I had to construct deal proposals and, and figure out deal terms. How old were you at this point? Uh, anyway? This was, uh, I was probably mm, early 30s. I just like, because you said, hey, kid. And, you know, with the, the, we, we've just gone through like investment banker, power agent, consultant, uh, you know, Disney's in the strategy and corporate, and you just referred to yourself as, hey, kid, after all that. <laughs> I like it. But you know what's funny is that people remember you as to the it, the era of, of your life in which they knew you, in which they first were, uh, yeah. which they first anchored and formed their opinion of you, right? They remember you as that. So, uh, so even though I helped Michael build that business from the ground up, right, I also... And I have no qualms saying this. I also carried his briefcase, right? Um, both literally, both figuratively and literally. And you know, and so that's that's kind of the the thinking behind it is that um, you know it's 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 that sort of thing, you know. And you know how it is. It's like when you get together with your college buddies, you you become the same sort of you fall into that. As a matter of fact, I take a uh, uh, well pre COVID, I took an annual trip with some of some of my longtime buddies, and everybody is prominent and successful. But for some reason, whenever we go, we we go to and, and we stay in hotels. We stay in two and three people in a room, like as if we were like still twenty one years old or twenty two years old. So yeah. that's that's kind of that's kind of what what that is. So. It's it's fun. And so, yeah. how long were you at MediaLink? I was at MediaLink for seven years. So sure. I, I saw that through when again it was just Michael and just out of the apartment. We had a little office in um, uh, the Pacific Design Center. Um, all the way through, uh, you know, about 120 uh, people. Um, revenue had grown. Uh, well, let's say it had grown about 10,000 um, percent, and we we had gotten to um, I, pretty much everybody that that I can imagine um, in Silicon Valley, in Madison Avenue, on Madison Avenue, uh, ad agencies, media agencies, the studios. Um, were either clients um, or they we did deals with in some capacity. So, I mean, they, and, and, and just an update on that: they sold, I believe, it was two hundred to three hundred million dollars recently, a couple of years ago, to Can Lion, the owner of Can Lions. And I remember going to Can, and I met Michael years ago. But I went to Can, and people cracked jokes about like you have to pay respects to Michael and the mafia. Like 
they run Can Lion, which is for those that don't know, the biggest advertising conference and award show of the year, every year, all the big agencies, the big brands, that is the pinnacle. And Michael, without actually officially running it, ran it. And then the parent company of Can Lion bought MediaLink. That's right. That's right. And, um, and, and, you know, and that's, it made me feel very, very happy. And for, for everybody, at, um, for the entire team, um, a lot of the team that, you know, we had helped, that I had helped build, um, and especially for Michael, because Michael, it's just, it's just such a, such a case of, I mean, it started from nothing, you know, like this power broker, this, like this super agent, this, some people even call him a mob boss. And if yeah. he's Tony Soprano, I'd say I, I was like the nephew, Christopher, right? Wasn't, wasn't a son, wasn't the son. He had his, he had his family, but, uh, but I, for, for many years there, I was very, very close. Um, and I had that type of relationship. With him. Awesome. So we have a few more minutes. I want to make sure we get, so is that when you left to start your tech business? Yes. Yes. After that, because I had seen so many opportunities, um, throughout, right? Like so many, uh, um, cause we work with everybody. Uh, yeah. including the Silicon Valley VCs, including uh, enabling technologies, startups. And I saw an opportunity in structured data. And in particular, I saw an opportunity in um, video personalization. And so um, I left MediaLink, um, raised some capital. Uh, at the time, it, again, timing, you know, yeah. uh, at the time I raised capital, um, the markets were very, very, um, some would say frothy, but I just say positive, you know, the, um, and also people had gotten to know me and I had, I had at the time done a lot for, um, the, the companies, the portfolio companies of many VCs. So raising capital, I got very lucky. It was very it was relatively easy to raise capital. And so I, I raised capital and we built a, a structured data company. Um, and that, that we use the technologies we built, uh, we built to, um, uh, you create a video personalization engine and that video personalization engine, for those that don't know, it's, it's uh, making sure the right video um, on over the top platform streaming companies, that right video, um, the technology behind how that right video uh, is not necessarily served, but how it's offered, offered up from a recommendation discovery search uh, standpoint. And uh, we work with everybody, everybody other than Netflix, they had their own, um, they had their own internal um, uh, group. And, um, and uh, in 2016, uh, one of the companies we worked with um, acquired us. And, yep. uh, and that was Hulu. Awesome. Well, by the way, by the way, back to the how life, you know, and relationships and reputation and all that is important. So um, when you work hard and you, and you work hard and you do good work for people and you are kind and generous and you give more than you take. So check this out. So on the board of Hulu, um, were, uh, uh, was first of all this great guy named Randy Freer, who was, uh, who was one of the top uh, media executives from News Corp. Um, and uh, you know, he I have a lot of respect for him as well. And uh, another person on the board was a guy named Kevin Mayer. And so, um, when Hulu was taking a look at um, you know, taking a look at their strategic options, you know. It was good. it was good to have done good work and had a good reputation with Kevin Mayer. Um, yeah. and by the way, for those that uh, that, that don't know, um, Kevin Mayer has sort of since he, he became the chairman of Disney Plus. He stood up, launched, and uh, grew that service, which is um, the top streaming service, and then he became the CEO of TikTok. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, so yeah, so I, so I did that. <laughs> Um, and then just, just, uh, Eric, and I know, I know we, we are limited on time. Hopefully yeah. we can keep the clubhouse room open. If anybody wants to, uh, have questions, even after the Hawk talk, I'm happy to take questions or, um, anything else. We can keep the clubhouse room open. Um, but just in the interest of time, um, after that, one of the companies, uh, that, uh, was interested, um, uh, was at t entertainment. They had launched, uh, oh, by the way, so I spent about a year and a half at Hulu, um, integrating the tech and the team. Uh, then one of the companies I was interested, um, uh, but we just, we, it didn't, it didn't work out. Um, uh, they called me up and I was, uh, at t Entertainment. They were launching a VMVPD product, which is a, essentially like a, a bundled, uh, cable product, but over the internet, um, in, uh, something called DirecTV now. 
and they asked me to come over there and help them take, you know, take a look at their personalization engine and their metadata. So that was um, end of 2017. And uh, since then, I've kind of been part of the uh, AT&T family. The guy that brought me over, uh, he was asked to be the founding uh, president or rather general manager of the direct to consumer division of uh, Warner Media. And that division was launched uh, in order to uh, stand up HBO Max. And he asked me to be the chief business development and chief strategy and business development officer. So I, I was part of the founding team of the direct to consumer unit at Warner Media. And uh, I, I did that. Uh, and then I, um, then I, then I moved up to AT and T, and uh, again worked with a great me mentor. Co continue to work with a great mentor in the current chief strategy officer of the holding company, the parent company of Warner Media, um, in uh, strategy and M and A. And that's the story. That's a great story. So, last two questions, rapid fire. Number one, what's next? Without disclosing too much. <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, I. I'm very long on. Um, I'm very long on the, the next the where the creator economy. Okay, mm -hmm. as these new platforms come to be, and Clubhouse is one of them, by the way. Um, yeah. uh, there is, if you if people can people can create content very easily on these on these platforms, but as long as you're on these platforms, the monetization of the content and how you make money on the, on the platform will, will necessarily and always be controlled by the platforms themselves. And in other words, they could flip a switch and shut down monetization, change ad splits, you, you name it, right? So I think there's a tremendous opportunity in, uh, because the democratization of content creators, um, but, but they often, can't continue to do it because you need money to do it. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity in uh, in helping these content creators monetize off platform. In other words, creating businesses for them that don't just rely on the platforms themselves. Yep, hundred percent. All right, one sentence, last question. Uh, what would be one thing you would tell people if they're looking to achieve their dreams? You got to do it. You got to be in media and at the highest level. Someone else, it's you know whether it's watching movies or figuring out a completely different thing. What's one piece of advice to achieve your dream? So many things to say, but the uh, the one sentence I would say is: be kind, be generous, and take less so you can get more. Amen. Thank you, Xavier. It's been awesome to have you on Hawk Talk. This was great. Awesome story. That's awesome. Um, I'll stick around in the clubhouse room if anyone has any questions. And thank Perfect. you, Eric. And thank you for embodying those three things that I just said. Appreciate you. All, All right. right. We'll talk soon. I'll see you on clubhouse. All right. You've been listening to the Hawk Media Podcast. To ensure that you never miss an episode, make sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.